Good morning. I was caught being friendly again, shame on me. Uh, it's so good to have you here in worship today. It is uh, our delight to welcome you. Uh, just a few announcements. Some of you know that we've begun to gather your uh, questions, your uh, suggestions regarding the new lead pastor who will be appointed to arrive here in July of 2019. Uh, and there is a suggestion box over in Linder Hall and another one in the church office. And uh, there is also the ability, as I think most of you know, to make your suggestions online. Uh, the Pastor Parish Committee appreciates your participating in this way. Uh, very important. Secondly, some of you may have received a card this morning. Did any of you receive a little card at any point? Look at that. Well, if it, go, it went to people who, I'm told, greeted others with the words, the peace of Christ. So you might keep saying it, who knows? You might get a card as well. Actually, Courtney's back there uh, prepared uh, to help. You can take that card to the church office and you'll receive a mug with the peace of Christ, First United Methodist Church on it. So uh, some call it bribery, I just call it good fellowship. Uh, so it's a joy to have you here and sharing in that way. And so with that in mind, I'm going to invite you please to stand and greet one another with the signs of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you.
I invite you to join me in the prayer of confession. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may be perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen.
You may be seated. You know, each Sunday we are welcoming guests who share a bit about our stewardship activities this fall, and we're happy to have John Mathis, who is going to be uh, speaking a word for us uh, today. I'm John Matheson, and I'm here to share a personal perspective on stewardship. Forty-five years ago, when Belinda and I were newlywed, we joined a church in our new neighborhood just in time for the stewardship campaign. <laughs> Timing. After hearing a few sermons and uh, stewardship talks, we decided to work towards tithing, knowing it would take a while to get there. At that point in our lives, we were both very familiar with the Christian community, fellowship, support, Bible study, global outreach, many things that have great value for us and are worthy of our support. Programs and ministries that you just don't find anywhere else than in the church. Now tithing, giving 10%, is a tradition with long roots in the Old and New Testaments and is suggested as a standard of giving by a number of denominations. Still, giving 10% seemed like a tall order to me until I met a person who gave 90% and lived on 10. That was R.G. Letourneau, an inventor of large earth-moving machines, and I was there as a 12-year-old uh, to hear him uh, and that was actually in Crestview, Florida in 1958. Speaking of stewardship, though, we shouldn't out overlook uh, John Wesley, who is in mosaic over there on the front of the pulpit. In his sermon entitled, The Use of Money, he said, earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. That is, we need to pay the bills at home, take care of our family, and then give what is left over. Now, Wesley had neither wife nor children, so everything that was left over, he gave away. Over his lifetime, he maintained a frugal lifestyle, while his earnings increased substantially, uh, in part due to income from his published works, such that at one point, he was living on 2% and giving away 98%. I don't mean to compare our stewardship today with 18th century Wesley giving. It's just that after looking at Wesley's giving, 10% starts to look sort of manageable. Considering our common human condition, it must be at the DNA level, we are driven to accumulate, and we never sense that we have enough. The more we have, the more difficult it is to give it away, and at some point, we no longer own our possessions. They own us. How do we break with this dependency, and where do thanksgiving and generosity come from? I think a large part of the answer can be found in giving money and possessions away, uh, best starting at an early age, when all we have is what our parents have given us. And we continue growing our giving as we become mature adults when we recognize that all we have is what God has given us. Would you please join me for the prayer for illumination? Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Today's gospel lesson comes from the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. Will you please stand for the reading of the gospel? As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. 
You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother, he said to them. Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left the house, brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields, for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, Rick. And John, thank you for your words. Uh, My first Sunday I preached here, some friends back in the Midwest saw the pulpit and they made the comment, it's John Wesley with bling. (laughs) Kind of interesting with bling, given his uh, dedication to sharing with others. Hear this poem that comes from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, written in 1944 from Tegel Prison. He was imprisoned there, as some of you know by the Nazis. We saw the lie rise its head and failed to pay homage to truth. We saw others in direst need and our own death was all we feared. Would you bow with me as we pray together? Now to the one who, by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly more than we can ask or imagine, we open our hearts and minds in faith. Amen. So who will set the table? It was a question we asked last week, and some of you remember that we said, well, the journey of faith is a journey that is full of small deaths and little resurrections. Our life goes on and continues to change as we grow as a disciple. You also will remember, perhaps, that we said the opportunity is to take the barriers, the boundaries, and flip them into tables, to turn the boundaries of our lives into tables. During these weeks, we're considering great questions from the Gospels. That was the first one, who will set the table? Uh, Next Sunday, we're going to talk about uh, how can I be young again? How can I find youth? We're also going to be talking down the road about who it is or how is it possible to be great? Who can be great among us? Uh, Today is one of the questions I, I wanted to avoid, but there it was. Of what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's not the question so much that is troubling, it's Jesus' answer. And often 
questions tell us more. We learn more from the questions we ask than the answers, but this is one of those occasions where the answer hits us squarely in the face. My, my, what an answer Jesus gives. Uh, my son and I like to share questions with one another. Uh, he he uh, often sends me little silly questions, and it tells you more about our sense of humor than anything else. Uh, my son wrote a few years ago saying, Papa, so what was, the, what was the thing better than sliced bread before there was sliced bread? <laughs> and I wrote him back and said, if a turtle you, loses its shell, is it naked or homeless? And he wrote back and, and had this one, Papa, what if there were no hypothetical questions? <laughs> Got to think about that one a little bit. And I write, wrote him, and this was, I thought I beat him, but I didn't. I wrote him and said, if you plan to fail and succeed, what have you done? Questions can tell us more about uh, how we view the world uh, than sometimes the answers. But serious questions like the one today shape us. This one from Mark 10 is not a hypothetical question. This young man is very serious when he comes to Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And the answer Jesus gives him is sell all your possessions and give to the poor. Now, preachers over the years have stretched themselves like Gumby to try to get around this answer. Uh, they, they are uncomfortable with it. I'm uncomfortable with it. A part of the challenge is understanding what's the background in these two scenes? What's going on with the understandings of Jesus and the young man? Some of us would like to have nice answers to give him to this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We would like to say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. But that's not the answer Jesus gives. Or we might say, you know, you need to go see a therapist. You seem a little stressed. Or we might say, be great for you to go to theological school. I understand they have online classes and they can help you with this. Or... You might say, have you tried the new diet? It will, it will help you feel better about life around you. No, that's not what I'm able to do this morning, to give some kind of psychological or spiritual uh, slant on this that changes the difficulty. Barbara Brown Taylor, uh, that wonderful preacher, has said, it is possible to mangle this story in two ways. First, by acting as if it's not at all about money, and second, by acting as if it's only about money. The exchange, you see, is a poignant one in so many ways. We read the young man was earnest. He ran after Jesus, pursued him. He was eager. He desired to be righteous. And he desired it much more than I think we can understand. Jesus looked at him, and what does it say? He loved him. There, there was a sense of connection with this young man. But each word in the question is dangerous. It should have a danger sign or a footnote behind each word. What must I do? to inherit eternal life. Each word, you're lucky I don't preach a sermon on each one, <laughs> loaded with, with, with dynamite, interpretive need around each word. And again, Barbara Brown Taylor says, none of us earns eternal life. No matter what we do, we can keep the commandment, she says, until you're blue in the face. We can sign our paychecks over to Mother Teresa and rattle tin cups all around for our supper, but we will not earn a place at God's banquet table by that. 
The kingdom of God is not for sale. The poor cannot buy it with their poverty any more than the wealthy can buy it with their riches. The kingdom of God is God's consummate gift to be given to whomever God pleases for whatever reason God pleases. That's part of the challenge of this question. The young man is asking, can I purchase it? Uh, I didn't inherit it along with everything else. But then there's that word do. Oh, what must I do? Like so many in our day and time, we're caught up in doing, aren't we? Many Christians are, are better at being human doers than human beings. We've lost the ability to understand that God is going to be there with us no matter, but there are some expectations of those who would be disciples. Some of you may know the work of Marie Kondo. Any of you know a Japanese woman? who quite wisely says, you know, we need to be decluttering our lives. We need to focus on what we can give away. How we can do that, she says, is critical in this regard. What in your giving will bring you joy? Very good, good philosophy. But Jesus is saying this and so much more. Jesus is calling on the young man to give, live a life of discipleship, not a life of poverty. He's suggesting that the kingdom is already all around them. Pay attention. Now, we're reading a little book uh, this month by Frederick Beekner called The Remarkable Ordinary. And in it, he says, you cannot love your neighbor without seeing your neighbor. Pay attention. Eternal life, the Greek phrase is zeon aeonion. Life everlasting. Life of this age, really, or life extending from now forward. Several contemporary evangelical authors, by the way, are arguing that what Jesus is responding to here is helping the young man who also sees the tragedies, the violence, the potential of Rome to tear everything up that they value, to destroy the Jewish Hebrew traditions. Jesus is saying to them, to him, get on board with this new emerging order, this new creation, this new earth that's all around you. As Sam Wells, who's the pastor at St. Martin in the Field in London says, really, discipleship is the call to be with. To be with. To be with God and to be with the neighbor. Who we are is understood best by who we are with. Forty years ago, uh, Elaine and I began to consider our giving. Over the decades, we've often lived on meager incomes. And over the years, uh, there have been other years when we were blessed with great abundance. We've had the joy of having wealth and of knowing poverty. Back in about 1974 or 75, we heard of a concept called a double tithe. <clears throat> to give double a tithe or, or even more. And this became a custom for us, a way of life. Many years when we were in ministry in core city neighborhoods, uh, we made very little. We qualified for every poverty program there was. Uh, we wore secondhand clothing. Uh, we ate modestly. As a matter of fact, if I never see another lentil again, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> I had lentil patties, lentil soup, lentil everything. Our children grew up in that world. I remember uh, one of the great lessons for our daughter Lydia was all of the kids during that uh, period of time were wearing Izod clothing, you know, with a little alligator. 
So mom would go to the thrift shop and buy something secondhand, cut the alligator off and tie it and attach it to Lydia's clothing. It was her way of being part of the in crowd, but it was our struggle. No, it was our joy to be a part of those years. We've kept this giving pattern going. Uh, we learned two lessons. Number one, we, are, we will always be wealthy, no matter how little we have financially. We're rich in friends, we're rich in family, we're rich in language, we're rich in imagination. We could never give those things away. And, and the second lesson we learned was, no matter how much we save by buying things in bulk or, or at a thrift shop, the question wasn't, what did you save? How much did you save? But it was rather, what did you do with the money you saved? Those were lessons that came from those periods of our life, but I want to tell you, we didn't find it burdensome. Uh, because, you see, we were being taught by many others around us. They modeled the same life or better lives on a meager income. Two come to mind today, Sister Jaislin and Sister Arletta. They were both members of an African-American church where I was a pastor for a few years. Sister Arletta was a church mother. Do you know what a church mother is in a black church? Um, well, sort of in charge. This church had four church mothers, so I was always being uh, cared for, we'll say. Sister Arletta would often come to me after worship, and she would say, see you this afternoon, my place, uh, peach cobbler, be there. <laughs> it, it wasn't a question. It was an order. And many times I sat with Sister Arletta and had my job performance review done right there at her table. <laughs> it was a little shotgun house on Gum Avenue in Evansville, Indiana. She would teach me about that church, about that culture, about what I was doing right and where I was making, yeah, some mistakes. But what I remember most is Sister Arletta would, as I was getting ready to leave, as we'd prayed together, she would slip back into her bedroom and come out with an envelope or two. And she said, now, Pastor, this is just between us. Nobody's to know. And there would be a name on that envelope, and she would say, uh, th this is for Sister Purcell, or this is for Brother Lincoln, or, or, or this one here, well, you know, you know that, that, that Sister Tuck is having some difficulties these days. I never looked in the envelope. It was thin. I knew what it was. It was one bill, probably a 10 or a 20. I was carrying a treasure. It was the widow's might. She was teaching me about life that continues on. Oh, and then there was Jaislyn. Now, this is maybe the most amazing one. I met this woman on the street there in that inner city neighborhood. Uh, she lived there with her two sisters and her mother, another little home. What surprised me, though, fairly soon was to discover that she was an account executive at a marketing firm in town. But Jason was choosing to use her resources in different ways. Two years later, I found out she had been a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, later, I found out that she had spent two years in Latin America doing research. Mostly, though, when I think of Sister Jason, I think of her dented white Chevy Nova, full of children. Uh, sometimes eight or ten or twelve children. The reason I see that is my two children were in that car, age four and seven or thereabouts at the time. I could see them packed in, and they were off to the choir practice, Busy Bee Singers Choir. Jason had no training, particularly in music. She learned to play the piano. 
but she wasn't trained as a choral director. That didn't matter. She saw a need. She had a vision, and she started a children's choir. And to this day, I can see my dear son trying to double pump up the aisle. You know, we've come this far by faith. I'm pretty bad. He was worse. <laughs> or he would be doing soon and very soon. We are going to see the king. My children, I inflicted them with a terrible childhood. <laughs> Actually, they would say just the opposite. They would talk about the abundance that they learned from a different group of people in a different place. You see, our extra tithe that we gave was just a natural part of an abundant community in which we lived. Too few outside it were privileged to know about it. Today we are sharing in a gospel mass by Robert Ray. Ray too knew the world of poverty and the abundance there through his connection with the African American Church, African American Methodist Church. He grew up shaped by that church in St. Louis. He studied at Northwestern University, go Cats. And he also took a job then at the University of Illinois. The Gospel Mass was premiered in 1979 by a chorus of Dr. Ray's African-American students there in Urbana. Ray expected it to be a one-time performance even though there was an incredible response, he tucked it away in a drawer and thought that was it one time. And then a colleague, a friend who taught in high school, said, could we perform it at this high school? And the rest, as they say, is history. That mass became a phenomenon, it exploded. It's performed all the way from, uh, well, San Diego, to Warsaw, Poland, from South Georgia to South Africa. Dr. Ray had an image, you see, that saw the abundance of his childhood that could be shared in new forms. When I hear the music, I have many thoughts about abundant life. God's kingdom now. Sister Arletta, Sister Jason, my son, my daughter, the promise, you see, is about God's everlasting presence. It's about God's abundance, not ours. We're going to be standing in a few minutes as the choir comes to sing the credo. Uh, if you wish to remain seated, that's okay too. But. As the choir comes, I invite you to stand as we continue in worship today.
Amen. At this time, I invite you to be seated. We continue with our worship by giving to God our tithes and our offerings. I invite the ushers to come forward. You may be seated. In the United Methodist Church, the table of our Lord is open to everyone who believes, who comes with a heart seeking to follow the Christ. And so it doesn't matter if you're a member of this church or any church or no church, if your heart is, heart's desire is to follow Jesus, then you're welcome at this table. I invite you now uh, to the words of invitation that you find printed in the bulletin. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give you thanks, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity and made covenant to our to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through your prophets. But we looked to you and you were there for that day we knew was coming when justice would roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty flowing stream. When nations would not lift up the sword against other nations, neither would we learn war anymore. And so with all your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and the recovery of sight to the blind, and set at liberty those who are oppressed, announcing that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you ex exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. And so on the night when he gave himself up for us, he took bread and he gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Likewise, he took the cup and he gave thanks over it and he said to the disciples, drink from this all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Pour out your Spirit and make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever.
because we are one loaf, we are asked to remember and be remembered. This body of Christ is given for you. The bread we break together is a sharing in the body of Christ. And this cup that we share, this is given to each one of us so that we might participate in the sharing of the blood of Christ. And so we give thanks over these elements that we may receive them as gifts from you. We'll ask the communion stewards to come forward. All is made ready. I would remind you that in this service we receive in the pews and so a tray will be passed to you and you can take a piece of bread and then wait and we'll all receive it together. And you can also receive the cup that comes to you. And so dear friends, we're able to share in the life everlasting that's already present among us. And as we feast on God's gifts, we know God's greatness among us.
Would you join in the prayer after receiving? Eternal God, we give thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, in churches like the one I serve, there would have been a lot of amens this morning. Amen. Very good. Uh, actually, after Jabon's uh, piano piece, I want to say amen. Actually, what I wanted to say was, yeah. And thanks to this choir and to Dr. Wick for their work on this. Oh, the guitarist as well. Jeff, thank you. And so now, may you go in peace. May you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and thereby, may you always remember that you are being redeemed. Amen.
Good morning. Good to see you. I think we'll let them come in here. Uh, great to have you here this World Communion Sunday as we worship together. Just a couple of announcements. First of all, you know, uh, if you've read your newsletter, that we're beginning to gather information from you about your preferences in our new senior pastor who will be coming next July. And the Pastor Parish Committee is already working on that. They want to hear from you about characteristics or qualifications you want to see there. There's a suggestion box over in Linder Hall where you can write that out, and I think there's one also in the church office, um, and, or you can do it online. So please be aware of that and share that information with us. Uh, secondly, some of you may have received a little card. Did any of you receive a little card? A few of you. That's, the, uh, well, the blue card. Yeah, I'll fill that out. But there's another blue card that you're holding up there, which is a Peace of Christ card, if any of you have that. And if you do, if you don't, do we have any more back there? Oh, why don't, if you would like one of these, would you hold up your hand? And then I'll tell you about it. These are, now, you, you must say to your neighbor, the peace of Christ. All right? And following service here, up here is uh, some. Following the service, you can go into the church office and uh, now watch the hands go up. And when you give that card, they'll give you a mug from the church with the peace of Christ on it. And so uh, we're happy to have that shared with you over here. Very good. So, with that said, what should we do next? I think we should share the peace of Christ. And so now, brothers and sisters, let me say to you, may the peace of Christ be with you.
Please join me in our prayer of confession. Let us pray together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. You may be seated. 
And we'll now hear from uh, John Matheson, uh, a witness to God's generosity. I'm John Matheson, and I'm here to share a personal perspective on stewardship. Forty-five years ago, Belinda and I were newlywed. Uh, we joined the church in our new neighborhood just in time for the fall stewardship campaign. After hearing a few sermons and stewardship talks, we decided to work towards tithing, knowing it might take a while to get there. At that point in our lives, we were both very familiar with Christian community, fellowship, support, Bible study, global outreach, many things that had great value for us and are worthy of our support. Programs and ministries that you just don't find anywhere else than in the church. Now tithing, giving 10%, is a tradition with long roots in the Old and New Testaments and is suggested as a standard of giving by a number of denominations. Still, giving 10% seemed like a tall order to me, at least until I met a person who gave 90% and lived on 10. That was R.G. Letourneau, an inventor of large earth-moving machines, and I was there as a 12-year-old when he spoke at our church in Crestview, Florida in 1958. Speaking of stewardship, we shouldn't overlook John Wesley, founder of, of Methodism, whose likeness is on the mosaic on the front of the pulpit. In his sermon, The Use of Money, he said, earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. That is, we need to pay the bills at home, take care of our family, and then give what's left over. Um, Wesley had neither wife nor children, so everything that was left over, he gave away. Over his lifetime, he maintained a frugal lifestyle while his earnings increased substantially, in part due to his published works, such that at one point he was living on 2% and giving away 98%. Now, I don't mean to compare our stewardship today with 18th century, 18th century Wesley giving. It's just that after looking at Wesley's giving, 10% starts to look a bit more manageable. Considering our common human condition, it must be at the DNA level that we are driven to accumulate, and we never sense that we have enough. The more we have, the more difficult it is to give it away, and at some point, we no longer own our possessions, they own us. How do we break this dependency and where do thankfulness and generosity come from? I think a large part of the answer is found in giving money and possessions away, best starting at an early age when all we have is what our parents have given us and growing our giving as we become mature adults when we recognize that all we have is what God has given us. Thank you, John. Would you all please join me in the prayer for illumination? Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read, and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. And everyone is invited to stand as we read the gospel lesson today. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother, he said to him. Teacher, I have kept all of these things since my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, said, You lack one thing. Go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor. 
and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked, and he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. And then Jesus looked around to his disciples. How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God, for all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who do not receive a hundredfold now in this age. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So in the early service, I uh, noted uh, when John spoke about, uh, when John Matheson spoke about John Wesley, that uh, when I preached here my first Sunday, I had friends from back in the Midwest that watched the video, and they said, well, this is John Wesley with bling. A little, a little bling, a little extra added energy, right? Thank you, John Matheson, so much for your witness. Thank you, Jason. And we're going to hear more from the choir in a little bit. I invite you to hear these words from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, spoken in 1944 from Tegel Prison, where he was held as a prisoner. This is the last verse of a poem. We saw the lie raise its head and failed to pay homage to truth. We saw others in direst need and our own death was all we feared. Would you bow with me as we pray together? Now to the one who, by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly more than we can ask or imagine, we open our hearts and minds in faith. Amen. Who will set the table? That was the question we asked last week, if you remember. And we talked a little bit about the journey of faith, which is a journey in discipleship where we move through what some have called, what my friend uh, Carl Dudley called, small deaths and little resurrections, ongoing growth as disciples. We also talked about turning the barriers in our lives into tables, changing from boundaries into places where we could serve one another. Uh, this month, we're asking questions, actually questions that arrive for, arise out of the Gospels. That was the first one last week. Next week, we're going to be talking about how to be young or, or what it means to become a child again. We're also going to talk about questions of when can we see, fully see, or who is it that's truly great? Today, we're confronted by this rather difficult text from Mark 10. It's the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a tricky question. Uh, the answer is even harder. Most preachers try to avoid this text. Usually, uh, if you're preaching from a lectionary, uh, the pastor will read that and say, I think I'll preach from the Psalms this week. Some nice, easy word. None of this talk about giving everything away uh, so the poor can benefit. My, my son and I like to exchange silly questions. Uh, Andrew once sent me, uh, not long ago, 
uh, an email that said, Papa, so what was the greatest thing before sliced bread? And I sent him back, if a turtle loses its shell, is it naked or homeless? And he came back at me with the question, what if there are no hypothetical questions? You got to think about that one a little bit, right? And I came back at him with, if you try to fail but succeed, which have you done? <laughs> questions, silly questions. Questions are often more important to how we understand the world than the answers we get. But this is a time when Jesus is asked a very tough question, but the answer he gives is even more difficult. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. Uh, preachers over the years have tried to dodge this when it's difficult, the weight of the answer that Jesus gives. Uh, we have tended to try to turn it into some kind of psychological or spiritual double meaning dodge the hard edge challenge here. Uh, some think that Jesus should have answered it by, by saying, well, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. But, but that's not what he says. Uh, some might say, you need to change your diet. You seem to be a little agitated. Some might say, go to theology school. They help with answers like that. They even have online programs. Some might say, you know, you might want to visit a therapist. You seem a little on edge. It says that the young man ran to Jesus, eager. He knelt before him, and Jesus saw him, and what does the scripture say? He loved him. He cared for that young man. He cared for that question being asked. But, you know, the answer that he gave is one that we have a little trouble understanding in our day and time. Barbara Brown Taylor says that uh, it's possible for preachers to mangle this story in one of two ways. First, by acting as if it's not about money at all, or secondly, by acting as if it's only about money. You see, the exchange is poignant He's eager, and he asks a question where I think every word should have a danger sign beside it, a footnote to explain every word. What must I do to inherit eternal life? There's a sermon on each of those words, and yet... You don't want to sit through that many sermons, and so I've got to try to sort out with you what I think is going on here. Let me start with Barbara Brown Taylor again, who says none of us etern earns eternal life. No matter what we do, we can keep the commandments until we are blue in the face, she says. We can sign our paycheck over to Mother Teresa's ministry and rattle our tin cups for our supper without earning a place at God's banquet table. The kingdom of God is not for sale. The poor cannot buy it with their poverty any more than the rich can buy it with their riches. The kingdom of God is God's consummate gift to be given to whomever God pleases for whatever God pleases. Perhaps a young man had inherited his wealth, and that's why he wanted to ask about an inheritance. Perhaps he thought he could purchase a seat in the eternal life ahead. But perhaps he was caught up, as many of us get caught up, on doing. What should I do? Oh, so many Christians go here and uh, we get turned into human doers rather than human beings. Perhaps you know the writing of a Japanese author, Marie Kondo. 
Uh, she encourages people to declutter their lives, to tidy up, to give away. She suggests that we need to rethink our relationship with stuff, with wealth. Uh, she says, what is your relationship with the things that you have? What can you give away, but do it in this way? What brings you joy in sharing it with others? It's a good philosophy, but Jesus is saying much more than this. Jesus is calling the young man to a life of discipleship, not a life of poverty. Jesus is suggesting that the kingdom is already all around you. Pay attention. For those of you that are reading the little book we're reading together in the book club this month, The Remarkable Ordinary by Frederick Buechner, you'll know that again and again he says something like this. You cannot love your neighbor if you do not see your neighbor. Pay attention. Be aware. Eternal life, or in Greek, zeon aeonion, is translated maybe a little better by life of this age and beyond, or life extending from now onward. Several contemporary evangelical scholars, interestingly enough, argue that Jesus is responding to the tragedies all around, to the abuse and the violence of the Roman Empire, to the potential fall of the temple. They're saying that the young man and Jesus are seeing the same thing. They're asking the same question. How do we make it through? How does our commitment to Torah, uh, to, to, to the Decalogue, how will we honor that in this age? How will it endure? It's a different way of attaining, you see, a radically different way of, the, of living than in the existing worlds we have. Sam Wells, who's the pastor, the preacher uh, at uh, St. Martin's in the Field in London, writes that this call to discipleship is a call to be with, to be with those around you, to be with God, to be with those who you may otherwise not be seeing. Over 40 years ago, Elaine and I began to consider the way we were giving our gifts uh, over the decades, uh, we had learned to live on a rather meager income. Uh, we also had other times in our life when we were blessed with abundance more than uh, we uh, knew how to handle, frankly, or deserved. Uh, at the beginning of our marriage, we were tithers. We gave 10%. And then along about 1974, 1975, I read and met people who would give a double tithe, and sometimes much more than that. This became our custom in those early years. We were in ministry in a core city neighborhood. Uh, we lived simply. We shopped at uh, secondhand stores. Uh, we wore clothing, you know, that my, my dear daughter, you remember the, uh, the alligator, the Izod shirts? Uh, Elaine would go to thrift shore stores, buy one of those uh, at a lower rate, cut the alligator off and sew it onto her shirt so she could pretend that she was one of those people at well, as well at school. Uh, we ate more lentil patties than, I, I don't ever want to see a lentil again. Don't want to look one in the eye. Lots of lentil patties, lots of lentil soup. But you know what? It didn't feel like we were in any way deprived. Why is that, you might ask? Well, the main answer I can give you is we were learning two things. Number one, we were wealthy and there were some things, some wealth we could never give away. We couldn't give away our friends, our family, our education, our language gifts, th the love that we had experienced. The other thing that we learned was, no matter how much we saved by shopping frugally, the question wasn't how much did you save, but what did you do with the money you saved? That became the critical question for us. 
But you know how we were able to do this mostly? We were fortunate enough to live in a community that understood abundance, even though it was one that was very poor. I want to tell you about two of my friends, my teachers. One of them is Sister Arletta, and the other is Sister Jaislyn. You see, I was pastor of a little African-American church in Evansville, Indiana during those years. Sister Arletta was a church mother. Do any of you know what a church mother is? Th yes, see? The church, you know, comes equipped with four or five women who are church mothers. Uh, and, and part of their job is to make sure the preacher stays in line, make sure the announcements are right, that if we need to take an extra offering that Sunday, we'll do it. Arletta used to say to me after worship, now pastor, I'll expect you to come over for uh, a little peach cobbler this afternoon. It wasn't a question. It was a command. It was my fairly regular job performance review from Sister Arletta Johnson. She would tell me the things I was missing, the things I was getting right. But the thing I remember most is that as we would pray and I would get up to leave, Sister Arletta would say, wait, wait just a minute, Pastor. And she would go into her bedroom and come out with a little envelope. And someone's name was on the front. And she would look at me and she would say, now, preacher, this is just between us. Nobody else needs to know. And on it would be the name of Mr. Purcell, or Sister Tuck, or Mr. Lincoln. I never looked in the envelopes, but I knew what was there. It was Sister Arletta Johnson's way of saying to people that, she, as she would put it, they're up against it this month. They're up against it, preacher. I knew what was in that envelope. It was probably one bill a $10 bill or a $20 bill, but I got to tell you, I carried it like it was a treasure because it was. This, you see, is what the Bible calls the widow's might. This, you see, is abundance. This is what leads to life everlasting. <clears throat> and then there's Sister Jaislyn, an even more remarkable story. Sister Jaislyn was a young woman, extraordinary woman. I didn't know how extraordinary she was. I met her on the street, not far from where she lived with her mother and two sisters, a little shotgun house there in the city. It was a little deceptive because Sister Jaislyn was an account executive for a marketing firm. She made a very good salary, but she chose to live in that neighborhood and she decided she would worship in our little United Methodist Church. And furthermore, after about, oh, I don't know, three months, four months, she decided God had called her to start a children's choir, the Busy Bee Singers. I can see her white, dented, shivy nova. Well, actually, I see it with lots of children inside because she would go around the neighborhood and pick them up, including our two little children, Andrew, and Lydia. I can still see them stuffed into this little car on their way a few blocks away to the church to have their choir rehearsal. Oh, and I, I remember my dear son, Andrew. He was four at the time. Bless his heart, he has even, well, he's got a little more rhythm than his father. But he would learn the songs of that church. I can still see him trying to double pump up the aisle, you know, We've come this far by faith. Leaning on the Lord. I couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. Or he might sing, Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Bless his heart. My children were shaped by this abundance. They wouldn't say to you that their childhood was one of scarcity at all. They would say that they had the extra gift of an abundant community, one that few people have the opportunity to share in. 
Today, we have the joy of sharing in this gospel mass by Robert Ray. Ray grew up in a world of poverty in St. Louis. He grew up also in a world of abundance where everlasting life was celebrated in that African Methodist Episcopal Church. He studied at the university, at Northwestern University. Go Cats. And then he taught at the University of Illinois. He started an African-American choir there, and he wrote this mass for them to sing. He said, I thought it would only be sung once. It was well received, but he put it in a drawer, hid it away. Many of his songs have become a part of the gospel tradition. If you know the song, He Never Failed Me Yet, that's Robert Ray. His music is sung from San Diego to Warsaw, Poland, from South Georgia to South Africa. When I hear this music, I know that he's about tidying up our world a little bit, seeing a larger world. He's talking with us about sharing. When I hear this music, my, my thoughts go back to an understanding of abundant life, everlasting life, God's kingdom now, to Sister Arletta and Jaislyn, to my son and my daughter. The promise you see in this scripture is about God's everlasting presence, God's abundance, not ours.
Amen. I would like to invite the ushers to come forward to wait on us for our tithes and offerings. You may be seated. Sister Jocelyn Thomas, I didn't know for two years, had been a Rhodes Scholar. It took me another while to find out she had spent two years on a research project in Latin America. Oh, by the way, she was a pastor with me later on after she was a distinguished fellow at Canberra School of Theology. She used to invite to the table those who were there by simply saying, makes no matter, makes no matter, God loves you. In the United Methodist Church, all are welcome at the table. And so we invite you to come today and receive communion. We'll receive by intention. Uh, As you are served, you simply take a piece of bread and dip it in the cup. And so all is made ready, dear friends. Let us then join in the prayer 
in your bulletin. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. We looked for that day when justice would roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nation would not lift up sword against nation, neither would they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that time when the Lord would come again to save the people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him and to seat at, sit at the right hand in your reign. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave it, thanks to you, gave it to the disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood poured out in the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is God in the Lord God of you. Christ is risen in the Lord God of you. Christ will come again, God of you. The risen God in the Hallelujah! Who can be victory? Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, that is redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory. Through your son, Jesus Christ, we pray.
And so let us join in the prayer Jesus taught the disciples to pray, which is, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are made one today in Christ's body. For we all partake of that one loaf. The bread which we have broken is a sharing in the body of Christ, and the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. We invite the stewards to come forward now as we prepare to receive communion. coming over the choir or around the <laughs> choir. There will be several, there will be several spaces for you to receive. You simply come and tear off a piece of bread and receive it.
Now may we join in the prayer after receiving. God, eternal, eternal God, God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in your strength of your spirit, give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, what a gift we've received. Uh, thanks to everyone. Well, wow, you guys knocked it out today. Thank you so much. I'm going to forget someone, but thank you, Jim. Thank you, soloists. Thank you. And that's, that's pretty good keyboard work, Jay Bond. <laughs> See, I'm used to hearing some amens, but I didn't hear many today. <clears throat> amens, okay. Yeah. Would you receive the benediction? And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit send you forth aware that you are being redeemed in the name of God who loves each one as if you are the only one loved and yet loves each as God loves all. May you go in peace. Amen. <laughs>